Good morning. Good morning. If we can get that Taylor clan to settle down. Good morning. Welcome. So glad to have you here this morning. Uh, a couple of quick announcements. First of all, I want to congratulate you. Uh, we met our Lottie Moon Christmas offering and exceeded it. Our goal was $5,000. And we saw $5,000 and just kept right on going. So congratulations and uh, praise the Lord most of all because obviously that money is used 100% to support missionaries who are on the foreign mission field. So um, that, that is a, a wonderful thing. Also, we have had an online giving uh, program and at least for the time being, we are going to suspend that. Uh, it's not being um, effective for us. And so if you have been giving online, I apologize. We'll continue to have our regular giving method, um, but no more online, at least for the time being. This morning, we're going to be taking the Lord's Supper. And so if you did not pick up a little communion packet when you came in, if you'll wave your hand, um, someone will be more than happy to get one of those to you. Got one here and one here. And then also, um, if you didn't grab sermon notes today, this is a good day to have your sermon notes. Um, there's, they're a little more interactive than normal, and so I just wanted to encourage you to uh, grab the sermon notes. Now, we are here to worship God. That, that is our, our primary purpose. And I'm going to use this example later on in the message, but the reality is that when you give a... When, when for instance, a, a, at a concert, at the end of the, the concert, the crowd gives a standing ovation. What they're doing is they are celebrating the performance that the people in the, the concert performed. And a worship service is, in essence, a prolonged standing ovation for God. This is where we have come together to have one thing and one thing only. We are here to celebrate God. And as we participate in the Lord's Supper this morning or as we're singing the praise and worship songs, or even as I'm speaking, the goal is to celebrate who God is and what He has done for us. And so I hope that you will make that your agenda this morning. It is so easy to be distracted and to look at, you know, look at other things or think about other things, but just discipline yourself to focus on celebrating adoring God this morning. Let's begin in prayer. Father, we are here to worship you. We are here to, to celebrate you. We are here to give you the ovation that is yours and yours alone. And Father, I just pray now that as we enter into this time of worship that you will help us because we are so easily distracted. We are so easily pulled aside and so, Father, I just pray that as we speak to you this morning, as we sing, um, God, that everything will be about you and you alone. Thank you so much. And I just, I ask for your, your blessing to be poured out on us this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, let's stand and worship. We will sing, 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 and make music. We 
BBC. Sing songs of country altar. I have talked about this song a lot, and every time before we sing, I always make, make sure to mention that this altar isn't ever closed. Whether it's this, the opening song of Sing, 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 where we're all have our hands up and praise and worship, and, and, and some churches jumping around. I know we're in a Baptist church, we don't do that. But, uh, or if it's a, a song like this, or like Greater Your Lord, where it's, it's slower, and we're, we're just uh, taking a step back and, and focusing. The, the altar is still open. But what I want to talk about now is, is the altar itself. Uh, the altar was, was designed as a place to, to give sacrifices to the Lord. In the Old Testament, a spotless lamb was given as a way to cover our sins. And then in the New Testament, at the end of the Gospels, the ultimate spotless lamb was given. Christ was the ultimate sacrifice that, that was given up to cover our sins. So that, that sacrificial system isn't anymore, but but that doesn't mean that this altar is gone. The The curtain may have been torn, but the altar is still open. We're still able to come and pray. In fact, now that that curtain is torn, now that Christ was sacrificed for us, we can come ourselves and pray to God. Christ is now our intercessor, not some priest that's, that's standing up to, to pray for us, not Brother David, not, not your Sunday school teacher. You are able to come and pray yourself to the Lord. So I want you to right now just stand and worship with us if you want. Sit and, and pray and focus. Come forward and pray if you need to. Let's, uh, but let's sing. Oh, come to the altar. Thank you. 
that it brings us in this world even um, even in dark times that that you're that you were willing to to send your son to die for our sins to cover us to allow us back into your presence Lord and I just ask now that you would speak through brother David let us hear the words we need to hear and be with us this week Lord and it's in your name I pray We have the opportunity this morning to celebrate the Lord's Supper, and this is an opportunity to be reminded of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. You know, the Lord's Supper is not just a ritual we do because, well, that's what we do. This is an opportunity for us to be reminded and to participate in a an actual um, celebration to re to remember Christ's death on the cross. And the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, on the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. Let's take time right now to thank God for the, the broken body of Jesus. Lord God, we are here to remember Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross. And Lord, we come to the time where we want to thank you for what Jesus did when he sacrificed himself. His body was broken. He was, he was torn and, and deeply wounded, Lord. And we recognize that it wasn't because of his wrong and his sin. He was the sacrificial lamb. He was the perfect um, blemishless sacrifice father we thank you for that thank you Jesus for being willing to go to the cross to die knowing that it wasn't you and it wasn't your fault you did it for us thank you then he gave thanks to God for the bread and he broke it into pieces and he said this is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper. Let's take a time to thank God for the blessing of the wine. Father, thank you for, again, what Jesus did for us on the cross. The fact that he was willing to shed his blood 
knowing, anticipating what was to come, I can't imagine how how terrifying and, and overwhelming it must have been. And yet, Jesus, you didn't give up. You didn't quit. You didn't take the the easy out. You did what was necessary. And I thank you that you were willing to shed your blood, to have your your skin torn and your hands and feet pierced so that we can be set free, not by our deeds, not by anything we've done, but because of your shed blood. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. He took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. Paul finishes by saying, For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Children's Church. Aren't you going? Children's Church, aren't you going? Well, good morning again. We have three parts to our identity. Um, and, and by that, there are really three aspects that make up who we are. First of all, the first question that we need to kind of deal with is, who did God make me out to be? Now, if a person is confused about this, they can waste their entire life trying to chase after 
what they think they're supposed to do or be, and as a result, they just they, they kind of squander their lives. You know, it really doesn't matter what other people say we ought to be or how we ought to be or what we should be. What matters is what God says about us. And someone can be the greatest of all time in a career field. You know, they, they can be the, the person. But if it isn't what God had set aside for that person, then they have literally wasted their life. You know, you can be a success in the world's eyes, but be an absolute total bust, a, a failure from God's standpoint. And ultimately, we're going to be standing before God, and so it's His opinion that matters more than anybody else's. The second thing we need to do is we need to know our purpose. The first one is, who did God make me to be? The second is to know our purpose. Why did God put us on this earth? We all have a purpose. We all have a mission to accomplish. And so it's important that we understand that and that we we seek to know what that purpose is that God put us here for. And then the third thing is to know when to do it. When all three of these line up, then you have the ingredients for a very successful life from God's standpoint. So what I want to do today is I want to look at the five purposes that we are on this earth for. Um, All of us have the same five purposes, but as unique as they are, as each of us are, those purposes will take on a completely different look in each of our lives. Uh, so what we're wanting to do today is to, to understand why, why did God make you? Why, why are you here? Now, I have a, a question before we, we get going on this, because this kind of plays in. Who would you say is the greatest king in the Bible? David. I've got lots of votes for David. Anybody else? Some in the early service suggested Solomon maybe being the greatest king. Did you know that neither of those, although those are certainly good good choices, neither of those are the greatest king in the Bible? Hezekiah is the one who is named as the greatest king in the Bible. And you're thinking, Hezekiah, I can't even spell that, much less why is he the greatest. But if you'll look with me in 2 Kings, beginning with verse 8 in chapter 18, it says, Hezekiah was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord. There was never another king like him in the land of Judah, either before or after his time. He remained faithful to the Lord in everything. He carefully obeyed all of the commandments the Lord had given Moses. So the Lord was with him, and Hezekiah was successful in everything he did. Wouldn't you like God to say that about you? Uh, I know I would, that you were successful in everything you did. And why was he successful? Because he obeyed God. He knew what, who he was, he knew his purpose, and he knew that when the timing was right to, to do things. So Hezekiah, being a normal mortal person, just like you and I, he lived, it says that he was king for 29 years. But the thing is, is he developed a terminal illness. He reached a point where um, the prophet Isaiah came to Hezekiah and said, you're going to die. And Hezekiah begged the Lord, and the Lord granted him 15 more years. Let me read that to you. It says, later, Hezekiah got sick. He was about to die. The prophet Isaiah said, prepare your affairs and your family. This is it. You're going to die. You're not going to get well. But notice, Hezekiah turned away from Isaiah and facing the wall, prayed to God. God, please, I beg you, remember how I've lived my life. I lived faithfully in your presence. I lived out of a heart that was totally yours. You've seen how I've lived and the good that I have done. 
Then God said, I've heard your prayer. I've seen your tears. Here's what I'll do. I'll add 15 years to your life. Now, that's a, a paraphrase from the Message Bible, but that gives us a really good insight into the heart of Hezekiah. When Hezekiah was told that he was going to die, instead of just saying, oh gosh, that's it, and, and just throwing in and, and giving up, he turned to God, he turned away, notice he kind of just rolled over in his bed, and he, he prayed a prayer of 37 words, and basically just said, God, you know I've been faithful to you, I'm asking you for more time. And I'm not asking you for more time so that I can just live my life and do what I want. I'm asking for more time so that I can continue to serve you. That's an amazing story. I've been faithful to you. Please give me more time. And this is, this is a, a, a critical point in this message because each of us need to understand that our days are numbered. We have so many days allotted to us. And I have some, some very personal questions I'd like to ask you. If God were to ask you to give him a good reason why he should let you live 15 more years, how would you answer? You know, if, if God looked at the last 15 years of your life, and for those of you that aren't 15 yet, well then, however many you've had. But if God were to look at your life and the way you've been living your life, would you have justification for asking for even another day? Are you willing to use the rest of your life, however long that is, the way God planned for you to use it? This is important. Because our lives do not belong to us. Just like with Hezekiah, God, God's initial message was, you're going to die. And Hezekiah was able to say, I have saved, served you faithfully. I have, I have lived a life that seeks to bring honor and glory to you. Please give me more time. And God was willing to do that. But are you... Are you willing to use your life, your energy, your resources to serve God and His purposes for the rest of your life? Now, if you answer no to that, you know, whether you outwardly just say no, or you just have no intention whatsoever of, of giving God the, the authority over your life, then my question to you is, why would God give you any more time to waste it? Because if you're not living your life to bring honor and glory to God, you're wasting your life. You're not using it for what it was intended to be used for. Now, if you answer yes, then obviously pay attention to the rest of this message. Because this message, I believe this morning, is one of the most important ones that I can preach to you. Uh, it, is, it, it has more with how to live the rest of your life than anything else that I could say to you. There are some other verses from the New Testament that kind of convey this, this same thing. Ephesians 5, begin with verse 15. Be careful how you live. Live wisely, not foolishly. Make the most of your time and take every opportunity to do good because evil is everywhere. Don't live carelessly without thinking. Instead, make sure you understand what the Lord wants you to do with your life. Are you doing those? In, in that text, there are five, five principles that we should be living by. We should be careful in how we live. We should live wisely. We should make the most of our time. Our, and we should make every opportunity to do good. And we should make sure that we know what God wants us to do. These are all so very important and they're so critical to our, our lives that we shouldn't just be bebopping through life, just kind of, oh, well, whatever, I'm just going to take today and see what happens. That shouldn't be the way our, our lives are. We should be living a life that is intentional, that is directed, that is aimed. 2 Timothy 2.21 says, If you keep your life clean from sin, 
you will be an instrument that God can use for his highest purposes. I want that. I, I want that in my own life. I, I want to be an instrument that is used for God's highest purpose. And I hope that that's kind of your, your mindset as well. And how do, you, how do you make sure that you will be an instrument used for God's highest purpose? By keeping your life clean from sin. We need to understand that all of us are going to be used for God's purpose. Pharaoh was used for God's purpose. Pharaoh wasn't too excited about how he was used for God's purpose when God made an example of him. But we need to understand that God will use us. And if we keep our lives clean from sin, if we keep our lives ready, spiritually prepared, so that, that we are available to God, then God will use us for His highest purpose. Well, let's look at how God wants to use us. And again, there are five, five items that we're going to look at here um, that basically explain how God is going to, to use us or how He wants to use us. First of all, God wants me to center my life around Him. God wants us to love Him, and He wants us to be focused on Him. God wants us to have a friendship with Him. Uh, God wants us to be loved by Him. He wants us to be the center. Uh, he, he wants to be the centerpiece of our lives. You know, if you think of a pie, he doesn't want to be a slice of the pie. He doesn't want to be half of the pie. He wants to be the apples in the pie. He wants to be the reason for the pie. All right? He doesn't want to just be a sliver or a slice or a piece here or there. He doesn't even want to be at all a mode. He wants to be the pie. Okay? Um, I always talk about food and get you all hungry. So, the first purpose purpose that that we need to understand that we are called to do is to worship now we are in a worship service but i talked earlier about the standing ovation analogy that a, a worship service is is where we all come together for the specific purpose of worshiping god but anytime anytime you are focused on pleasing god then you are worshiping him. Anytime you are looking to Jesus rather than focusing on your problems, then you are worshiping him. All of us have something that we are focused on. All of us do. And if you are focusing on God, then you are worshiping him. But if you are focusing on something else, then that's what you're actually worshiping. Most people think about themselves more than anything else. You know, they're, they're constantly self-focused. But you might be focused on your career. You might be focused on your family. You might be focused on money. You might have a hobby that you're particularly engaged in. And so you're thinking about your hobby all of the time. Anything that you focus on and think about more than God, the Bible calls that an idol. And the Bible has some pretty serious things to say about what happens when we make idols. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, is what the Bible says. And so we need to be really careful that even something as important in our lives as our children or our grandchildren or our, our immediate family, we can get wrapped up and that's a very noble thing. But if it's more important to us than God, then that is an idol in our life. Now, how do you know if something's an idol? You worry about it. You think about it. You obsess on it. That's an idol in your life. Worry is a warning light that our system has that something other than God is the center of our life. Peace is what happens when God is at the center of our life and we are focused on Him. Philippians 4, 7, and again, this is from the message, which is, is a um, paraphrase of the Bible. It says, a sense of God's wholeness 
everything coming together for good will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. Worship is the antidote for worry. Worship is what happens when, if you find you are worrying about something, maybe you have money problems and you're worrying about money issues, what you need to do is instead go to the Bible and look up all of the scriptures where it talks about the fact that God is our provider. And then you begin to worship God as the provider of your life rather than focusing on the money issues and what you're worrying about there. Make God the centerpiece. That's how you take worry and transfer it into worship. Now, the second, so the first purpose of our life is we are to love God. We are to worship Him. The second one is God wants us to learn to love His family. Love God, love your neighbor. Now, God created you to love. That, that's so important. God desires a family, and His family is the church. The church is the family that's going to last forever. Now, again, we can get really wrapped up in our earthly family, but do you realize that your biological family is only going to last as long as you are alive? Your spiritual family is going to last for all of eternity. And so while your biological family matters, it's important, your spiritual family actually is more important than your biological family. And again, I'm not suggesting for a moment that we disown our families. Sometimes maybe that would be a good thing. But I, I'm not suggesting we disown our family. I'm just suggesting that we need to understand the priorities. Our spiritual family, we will have for eternity. Our biological family, we won't. The church is, is a laboratory, if you will, where we practice learning how to love. Now, you people are all very lovable, but can I tell you a secret? Not everybody is lovable. I, you know, I, I, that may come as a shock, but not everybody is easy to love. But the church is where we come together and we learn to love each other, the lovable ones and the unlovable ones. We, this is where it's supposed to happen. This is the safe place where we come and we understand that all of us are not perfect. All of us have problems. All of us have dis issues that, that need to be dealt with. And so when someone comes along that's kind of hard to get along with, this is the place where we work at it and we learn to love them. Don't claim to be full of God's love and then not have any interest in loving the body of Christ because the two go hand in hand. Hebrews 10, 25 says, let us not give up the habit. And if you're following along that, that word habit, do not let us not give up the habit of meeting together. Instead, let us encourage one another. It is our, our place to be here, to have, make it a habit to be here. This second purpose, the first one is worship. The second one is called fellowship. Fellowship should be a habit. Now, again, I always say this because as Baptists, you think fellowship means eating. And that is incorrect, believe it or not. Fellowship is where you come together and you do life together. It's the physical, spiritual, mental, emotional, and physical coming together to be the body of Christ. Encouraging one another, supporting one another. In Acts chapter 2, it says, Those who believed were baptized and added to the church. They joined with other believers and committed themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship. They worshiped together regularly at the temple, and they met in small groups in people's homes. Now, notice the order that, they, that I just went through on those. The first thing is they, they believed in Jesus. That's the very first step to becoming a part of the family of God, is you believe in Jesus the next step is they were baptized. That's, they came into the fellowship of Christ. 
The third is they, they joined with a church family. They became a part of, of a church. This would be a good one if you're not a member of Park Baptist Church. Membership matters. It really does. It, it's, a, it's the way you say, I'm committed to serve. I'm committed to belong. I, I believe in the direction that the church is going, and we want to be a part of it. That, that's what membership is all about. It, it's not about numbers. It's not about you know boasting, or, well, I'm a member of Park Baptist Church. That, that's not the point whatsoever. It's the way you say, I am invested, I am committed. Then you commit to regular worship. That was the next step. They, they were meeting at the temple, and then they... That finally they were in small groups. They were connected to, to worshiping in, in people's homes. Now my question for you at this point is, which of these steps do you need to take? Maybe somewhere along there you've committed to Christ and you've been baptized, but maybe you haven't yet joined the church. Or maybe you've joined the church, but you're not really committed to regular worship. You, you're kind of hit and miss. Or maybe you're very faithful to worship, but you're not invested in a small group yet. Think about it. Pray about it and say, God, how would you have me be more involved? So worship, fellowship. The third thing God wants you to be involved in is he wants you to cultivate your spiritual maturity. In other words, to grow spiritually, to grow to be more like Jesus. It's wrong, it's abnormal to remain spiritually immature. Now, we are to be thinking, feeling, growing, acting more and more and more like Jesus. That's, that's, that's our calling. Hebrews 6.1 says, Let us go on and become mature in our understanding as strong Christians ought to be. This is called discipleship, and this is, this is so critical. You begin by you center your life around God, which is worship, and then you practice loving God's family, which is fellowship, and then you grow spiritually to become more like Jesus. That's discipleship. A disciple is a student, a learner in God's matters. Uh, you know, the, one of the problems that, that happens in churches, and again, we Southern Baptists are especially bad at this area. People grow older physically, but they don't grow spiritually. If you are not actively working to grow spiritually, don't assume that you are spiritually mature. Uh, it, it doesn't happen. A follower of Christ who doesn't grow is, is really a, a tragic event. Um, most of the harm that comes to the body of Christ comes from immature Christians. They've been around a long time, and so people automatically assign wisdom to them, but they don't have biblical wisdom because they've not taken the time to grow spiritually. Here's a simple test to see if you are a mature Christian or not. Can you explain to someone how to be saved? That's if, are you able to sit down with someone who maybe knows nothing about the Bible and take them from that point and lead them to salvation in Jesus Christ? If you can do that, then I would say, You're on the right track. You are growing to be a spiritually mature Christian. But if you can't do that, if you're sitting here going, oh, maybe I'll ask them to come to church with me and maybe the preacher can do it. If If that's your answer, then I would suggest that you are not a mature Christian. Hebrews 5.12 says, by now you should be teachers. Instead, you still need someone to teach you. Maturity in Christ leads you to be able to minister to other people. God wants you to be engaged in learning more about Him. That's part of the worship aspect. The more you know about God, the the more you study, the more you feed yourself, the more in love you will become with Jesus. 
you know, New Year's is all about getting physically fit. You know, I'm going to make resolutions that I'm going to eat right and I'm going to exercise. Well, how about this year we get spiritually fit? You know, what area do you need to improve spiritually? Make this the year that you get spiritually fit. Maybe you need better understanding of the Bible. Maybe you have a particular temptation that's you know, constantly tripping you up or uh, maybe you need to learn to trust God by faith better. Or um, maybe you just need to be more disciplined to stay, stay on track and do what needs to be done. Whatever area you need to get more spiritually mature, make that your, your goal, your, your path for this year. Where do you need to focus on improving this year? Worship, learning to love God, fellowship loving his family, discipleship, becoming mature spiritually. The fourth thing God wants me to accomplish is to, contr- is to contribute something back. 1 Peter 4.10 says, God has given each of you some special abilities. Be sure to use them to help each other. Use the special abilities you have to help each other, not to self-serve. You know, self-serve is great if it's ice cream, but if it's your spiritual gifts, that's not the right place to be self-serving. This is called ministry. When, when you serve other people in Jesus' name, that's called ministry. And you can do something as small as getting a cup of water for someone who's thirsty. If you do it in Jesus' name, that, that's ministry. God is invisible. And so our purpose is, or or what we, you know, we can't serve God directly because he's spirit, because he's invisible. So what we can do is serve God by serving those who are made in his image. Serve God by ministering to other people. Psalm 116, verse 12, David wrote, What can I give back to God for the blessings He's poured out on me. The real push in in life is for people trying to find significance in some way. You know, they're they're trying to find significance in their status. Or they're trying to find significance in the amount of salary, the money that they're making. Or maybe, you know, to be able to say, yes, I'm quite a success at, at this or that. Real, real significance in life comes from being a servant jesus said that he said if you want to be great be a servant now here's a question for you where are you serving you know um what are you doing for the kingdom of jesus christ whether it's here at park baptist or whether it's somewhere else what are you doing to make the world a better place the fourth purpose of your life is giving back Making a contribution, making the world a better place. That's called ministry. And then the fifth, God wants me to tell others about his love. Somebody cared enough to tell you, right? Whether it was at your bedside or as a child, maybe in vacation Bible school, wherever you came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, somebody cared enough to sit down And explain it to you. Well, guess what? It's your turn now to be that for other people. We're not here just to bask in the warmth of God's love and grace. And just to take it all in and say, ah, this is good. This is for me. We we are here to serve other people. And we are here to, to help them come to that saving knowledge. 2 Corinthians 5 says, Through Christ, God has made peace between us and himself. And he gave us the work of telling everyone about the peace we can have with him. So we have been sent to speak for Christ. This is called evangelism or witnessing. And it is one of the things that God, one of the purposes God has placed us on the earth for. Uh, 2 Corinthians 6.1 says, In our work together with God, We beg those of you who have received God's grace not to let it be wasted. 
if you were if you were a follower of Jesus Christ and you are not telling other people about Jesus, you are wasting the gospel. You are you are squandering the opportunities and the time that you have. A witness is someone who speaks to what they know. You know, in a courtroom, you have prosecutor and defender and jury and all of these other people, but you are a witness. Your only job is to tell what you know. You don't have to do any of the other jobs. You just say, this is what Christ has done in my life. This is what he has had, how he has helped me. Every person you know is either headed to hell or headed to heaven. Every single person you know. You have a responsibility to tell people the good news. It's criminal to keep silent. Tell them that their past is forgiven, that they have a purpose for living, and that they have a home in heaven. But if people don't know about it, if no one cares enough to talk to them, then that is criminal when you know the truth and you don't share it. If we're not willing to share, then what good are we on earth? Honestly, you know, if, if we know the truth and we're just sitting here with our mouths closed, then why, did, why does God keep us alive? What's the point? And there's two ways that you can share. You can obviously share by telling people the good news about Jesus. And you can also share by the way you live. Don't be a hypocrite. In other words, if you say that you believe in God and you are a follower of Jesus, then live your life in a way that looks like that. Don't, don't say one thing and act another way. You know, who do you know? That if they were to die today, to the best of your knowledge, they would probably go to hell. All of us know at least one person like that. So if you know someone, who is that person? In your mind, name their name right now. I would even encourage you to write their name down. Because guess what? That person is your mission field. You don't have the right... To opt out. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you're responsible for that person. And maybe you're sitting here going, I, I don't even know where to begin. Well, tonight at six o'clock, I'm going to be teaching on how to pray for the unsaved. And I'm going to just, it'll take maybe 30, 40 minutes, but I'm going to just teach on how to pray for unsaved people. And you can come and when you leave tonight, you'll know how to pray for them. That person that you are thinking about, they need to know Jesus. And it's your responsibility to help them. You pray for them. Invite them to church. Invite them to Bible study. Invite them to the small group that you're going to get involved in. Ask God to give you opportunities to share uh, your story with them. Worship, fellowship, discipleship, ministry, and witnessing. Those are the five purposes that you exist for. And I, I think, you know, if, if I could really encourage you to understand for the rest of your life, make those the priorities of your life. You were made by God for these five purposes you're not here just to live your own life and do your own thing. And please know, we're here to help you. Park Baptist Church exists for that purpose. We have the step classes, which the whole point of the step classes are to help you in these five areas. Uh, we have small groups. We, we have Bible studies. We have all sorts of different resources available for the very purpose you know, you can't just sit on the sidelines and say, well, I'm busy with my other things. You need to be involved. The purpose of the church collectively is to help you fulfill 
your purpose individually. I'm going to say that again. The purpose of the church collectively is to help you fulfill your purpose individually. And our goal here at Park Baptist is to help you succeed in filling your five purposes that God put you on earth for. Let's pray. Lord God, we are here to honor you. And if each of us will take these five purposes and live our lives with these five goals in mind, with these five objectives in mind, then we will be a long way down the road toward living successful lives from your perspective. And I thank you for that, Father. I thank you that you have not hidden yourself or hidden your will or your agenda from us. It's there for us. And I also thank you for the fact that if we will just but step out in faith and begin to do these things, you through the ministry and the work of your Holy Spirit will, will more than compensate for our, our weaknesses and our failures. Father, my prayer now is that you would just draw each person to yourself. Each of us, as unique as we are, have different sets of circumstances and, and concerns and problems. And Father, I just pray now that you would help us to, um, to respond to you according to your will, according to your desire. And I pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. As Christ is speaking to you and calling you, I just invite you to respond to him. Please stand. that you are leaving with just a, a renewed sense of commitment and, and investment in being faithful to Christ. Be back tonight at 6 if you, if you are wanting to learn how to pray for the, the unsaved. Greg, would you close us in prayer, sir? We just ask that you, you help renew us, Lord, and, and if, if we are courageous and and do what you tell us. And we just thank you for Brother David and the great message. We thank you for this awesome church. Just guide and direct us and bring us back safe next week. In your name we ask it all. Amen.